This is corneal curvature, keratometry, and corneal topography for B551, ocular motility, and refraction. Let's review the corneal optics quickly. The optics of the cornea provides about two-thirds, or about 40 diopters, of the total power of the eye. The lens being the other part that provides the power of about 20 diopters, or about one-third of the power. Here we have a picture of a cross-section of a, of a cornea in the clinic. I hope you can convey that there's actually a curvature of this, this cornea using corneal optical coherence tomography. Well, we talked about it being around 40, di 40 diopters or two thirds the power of the eye, but that can vary between people. Here we have two OCTs, one from, from one patient, one from another. And I hope you can see that the actual curvature between these two eyes actually varies quite a bit. And this means the optical, total optical power of the eye can potentially differ between these two people. The top one is more curved, so it'll have more power. The bottom one is, is, is flatter or not as curved, so it has less power. As we've said, the cornea provides two thirds, the lens one third of the power. Well, that allows the light to be focused back to the eye. Now that focus could be perfectly onto the retina, or it could be in front of the eye, retina or behind it. In this case, it's in front like myopia. Well, we talked about individual differences. What about within subject differences? We always assume that the cornea could be actually curved at different spots within the eye. It could be curved in the vertical meridian differently than the horizontal meridian, as an example. In this case, we'll look at the vertical meridian, and it's got one curvature. If we then go look at the horizontal meridian, it's, it has more curvature, or it's higher powered. So in this case, the eye has two different powers created by this cornea. And that's what the primary source of astigmatism is, is corneal curvature differences between the two eyes. Let's look at some corneal topographies to get a, a better idea of that. We'll get into topographies later in this talk, but corneal topographies essentially look at heat maps to measure the corneal, to, to examine the curvature of the eye. On the right, we have a spherical cornea. In that case, the entire cornea is relatively equally curved in all meridians. But we could have astigmatism like we just talked about. It could be with the rule where there's more curvature in the vertical meridian than the horizontal meridian. It could be against the rule of astigmatism where there's more curvature in the cornea on the horizontal meridian. Or it could be oblique at some random an angle of 140, 35, or 45. We could also have diseased corneas that cause irregular astigmatism. If we look at the keratoconus diseased example, we have a change in curvature inferiorly to the, on the cornea compared to superiorly, which causes high levels of, of ocular aberrations that interfere with vision. We could also, though, flatten the cornea in different spots. In this case, we've got a post-surgical LASIK patient who's had their cornea flattened to correct their myopia. A brief history of keratometry. The first attempts were made in 1753, and they thought they were measuring the accommodation of the eye. In 1853, von Helmholtz created a keratometer with a double image base, similarly used by astronomy to measure corneal curvature. By 1881, Louis Javal and Schiatz had a more easier design for clinical practice. Today, this is the most common keratometer people will see in their practices. This is a VNL Reichert keratometer. Most practices will have at least one of these sitting around somewhere, or used to at least. And the way that works is by focusing two different images on the, to the cornea, and we can align those images then to measure the curvature. At first, we have to focus the image. Like in step one, we are out of focus, so we then align it so that it's focused properly. In step two, we can see it's focused properly, but we need to then I'll find the right axis. What area is it at? Is it 180 and 90, or is it off at a different degree? So we can rotate to find the correct axis. And once we get to step three and we rotate it to the right spot, we then adjust the power wheels to determine the correct power of the eye. In, it, in example four, the horizontal meridian, or the two circles in the, on the, in the horizontal, are actually measured and aligned properly to measure the power of the horizontal meridian, but the vertical meridian still needs to be adjusted. We can then record our final cur curvature findings. In this example, right eye is 43.25 at 180 and 44.25 at 90 MCAR. You could also record instead of MCAR the actual words. They stand for Myers Clear and Regular. 
In clinic, though, we don't typically use keratometry anymore. And that's for the following reason. Let's look at these, this case here. They're 44 at 180 and 45 at 90. Well, all the keratometry is measuring is a couple discrete locations, which are marked out here in the black squares. So we only have actually a measurement of the curvature in a couple spots, and we're missing the entire rest of that cornea and how it changes. For that reason, we move on to corneal topography, and that's the more traditional method for measuring curvature of the front of the eye now. There's lots of different types of corneal topographies, but we're going to start talking about the first one developed, which is a placido-based disk system. Corneal topography comes from the same thing as a topographical lab map, a map of a land. If we looked at a, map, a topographical map, there are different lines within there to dictate the height elevation of the land. The more tightly packed those lines are, the steeper it is, or the, the, the more elevation there is. If those lines are spread further apart, the flatter the land it is. Well, it's the same thing with corneal topography, but in this case, we project those lines using a placido disc onto the cornea and then measure the distance between those lines to get the curvature or, or the elevation of that map, of that cornea. But the same thing happens. We can see that, then map these out in color maps and get areas that have steeper curvature or, or closer, tighter rings versus flatter cornea, corneas, areas of the cornea, which have further apart rings. But that leads us into components of a corneal topography map. The first thing that most corneal topography maps is has a curvature scale. As we discussed, redder colors typically have higher curvature, bluer colors have lower curvature. It's important to watch out for this scale because it can be easily manipulated by changing the range of the steps or the number of steps to change the perceived topography. So always pay attention to the corneal scale so you know what you're looking at. Typically, it also marks out the pupil. This is the optical zone where the person is seeing through primarily for their fovea. And so this is a critical region that we consider to look at the quality of the cornea and the quality of their vision. We can also look at localized areas of curvature. In this case, I've outlined a red area and a yellow area with different curvatures. Typically, most topographies also will give you a simulated K value. This is the same keratometry values that you would have had from the BNL keratometer, but they're estimated from the topog top topographic math rather than from direct measurement. And that's what allows us to develop these topographical maps that we can look at astigmatism, diseases, and changes after surgery. As we've said previously, looking at that pupil also allows us to look at the optical quality for that person. Here we have four examples where it starts out that the cornea is relatively uniform over the pupil. And as we move to the right, the, the topography becomes less uniform or more, more irregular over that pupil. So their vision will be worse as you move from left to right. These are four different patients. The one on the far right actually has something called a central island after ortho K, and their vision is terrible because they have this localized island of high curvature that's blocking their vision. Thank you.